Um, so racial formation uh, in, the, in the United States um, takes on the very big picture, right? It's, it's an attempt to sort of bring the history and theory and activism that has transformed the questions of race uh, in the last 50 years, 60 years or so, into one text, which is a, a remarkable uh, effort and achievement. It, it's really terrific. But as I told you, Michael, I would ask you just to start off with um, what your reception for this project has been. What, what were the early responses? We've talked about that shifting over time really dramatically. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we'll go into some key themes together. All right. First, I want to say hi to everyone, and, and thank you for hanging in. Uh, it's been a really uh, inspiring day. We had a lot of engaging presentations and a lot to think about. And in many ways, um, thanks, Tricia, for saying that the, the book is sort of big in terms of its uh, scope. But it's, it is because we've sort of depended on everybody else. We've sort of ridden on the uh, or stood on the uh, shoulders of giants, many of whom are here, and in many ways uh, have pillaged their work and, and utilized it in, in various different ways to think about our own notion about racial formation. Let me say in the uh, beginning, and I'm going to show you this slide. Um, don't laugh. Let's see here. Uh, <laughs> this, is, uh, this slide is sort of in, in, in deference to you Graceful Dead fans. Um, <laughs> but that, that was Howie and I uh, when we first started working on the first version of racial formation in the United States, way back in 86. Uh, that's me on the right, in case there's any confusion. <laughs> And, Still look just as <laughs> and uh, the issue for us, uh, in many respects, was we were trying to argue against a, a tendency within the social sciences to uh, not problematize what the concept of race was at all, to see it as a kind of objective fact, an independent variable, by which then people could do correlations and think about what are race and incarceration rates, or what did race and residential segregation look like, without thinking about what did they mean by race. And how was the concept of race itself transformed by these persistent kinds of patterns of structural inequality? Um, the other part of it was, you know, arguing towards a broader left, which we thought tended to reduce race to a phenomenon of class, and that uh, saw uh, race and racism as merely manifestations of a kind of more broader kind of class struggle, without thinking about the independence we may give to race and the ways in which um, notions of racial stratifications, notions of a racial state may sort of come to the fore. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you, when um, yeah. we first came out with the book, um, it was really disappointing that we got ignored a lot by social scientists. Mm. One of the quarters in which we were, uh, I got ignored by the left too, but in different ways. Um, and what was kind of both um, Interesting is what happened after that. I remember the first talk I gave on racial formation that I was invited to was actually the English department at the University of Wisconsin. And I thought, what am I going to talk to English people, uh, you know, people in the English department about? And so um, what was nice is to see how our book got received in quarters where we didn't think about, in literary cultural studies, which were emerging, with the, within the law, within history. Uh, and so it was really kind of thrilling to think about how um, we found new audiences that we weren't initially writing to, to but, in, but in fact it was only towards later that um, sort of uh, sociology and uh, other social science disciplines started to take us up and think about us seriously. So what, what were some of those early, when they, when they finally caught up and thought, okay, we better respond to this, what, what were some of the initial responses? Well, okay, first of all, thank you very much, Tricia, Tony, wherever you are, there you are. And the staff Bye. people, other speakers here, it's really an honor to be here. And also, I think it's a kind of a strange situation that we're in compared to all the other speakers. You know, we do give talks and have PowerPoints and things like that <laughs> at the time, but this is much more improvisational, so... Um, uh, it, it kind of makes you nervous in a way, um, at least me. So it's just as a preface, but it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, in, in, in terms of what we argued in the mid-1980s when we first published this book, it's striking how much of it has become kind of standard fare now. And um, 
that's not really so much our achievement because we were mm -hmm. synthesizing work that had been done before us. I don't think that we invented any of the major, major concepts that we're, known, you know, we're associated with. I mean, certainly social constructionism, social construction of race was something we, I think it's probably fair to say that we helped advance that concept, but we did not uh, invent it. It had, it had a very long, uh, complex history. And I think that, you know, in many ways, the, the work we're trying to do still today is about the kinds of subjects that have, uh, synthesizing the kinds of subjects that have been raised here. Uh, uh, the co corporeal dimensions of race are very important to us. Can you be both social construction, committed to, to a social construction orientation towards race on the one hand, and also take account of the racial body on the other? How do you handle that? Mm -hmm. It's a major contradiction in itself. Um, how, do we, how do we handle um, the different theories that we critique? I mean, the structure of the book, as some of you will know, be, it begins with uh, critiquing not only the class-based theories of race, as Michael mentioned, but also ethnicity-based theories, which are basically culturally oriented theories, and nation-based theories of race, which have a certain kind of primordiality or peoplehood quality to them. Mm -hmm. How do you critique that, that, these big bodies of work, and yet also incorporate them? Because mm -hmm. obviously it's not uh, at all possible to dismiss any of these other theories. So we, we start with that, we critique those theories in favor of the racial formation approach, which we then elaborate um, and discuss basically racial politics which we think uh, we're kind of, we've been charged with being political determinists and mm -hmm. we embrace that charge. Uh, the primacy of politics and understanding racial formation. And then we try to apply that new theory, our, our new theory, to recent racial development. So it ha kind of has that, that yeah. structure. And we've stuck to that, although in the, not in Keep on Trucking, but in the... Uh, I'll bring it back. In the new edition. <laughs> I won't take a page from Eduardo and say, buy the book, buy the book, buy the book. But um, if you look at the new book, you'll see that uh, it's, you know, it's been 20 years since the last edition. And just a few little things have happened in the last 20 years, you know? So there's, there's quite a bit of very, very new material and uh, things we, we're trying to take on. Right. But one of the things that I think is consistent through all the additions that I, is, you know, this tension that I think is important but has changed between the notion of sort of race making as fundamental to the American project, right? That it's not sort of tangential and subordinated to other things, but that it's also incredibly flexible and fluid and changing. So can you, either of you, speak to that, that tension and how you've developed it? Well, it's, it's kind of interesting because in the new book, um, we go out a little bit on a limb and suggest that uh, for us to consider that race in the United States, in the context of the United States, has served as a very, as, as a master category of stratification and difference, of othering in some ways, uh, as a template for how other forms of subordination have thought about, uh, have been constructed, as well as how um, forms of resistance to that oppression have been very fundamentally shaped by a lot of the strategies for around racial liberation as well. Mm -hmm. Now, in saying that, uh, you run into a number of problems. Certainly, it's not to, uh, I mean, we've learned a lot about intersectionality, particularly from the work of, of Kim Crenshaw, among others. And, and note that it's almost impossible to think about racial meanings or racial structures without thinking about its varied uh, dimensions along uh, class, gender, sexuality, among other uh, axes of difference. But the point I think we're trying to make is that race has, has you know, in many ways, uh, it's sort of the, the original sin in the United States and, and in many ways have, has served. And here, I, I, it's certainly about racially based slavery, as, as, uh, as Dave uh, pointed out. But uh, it's also about, um, in, you know, the genocide of indigenous peoples. It's about settler colonialism. Right. It's about a whole host of things which have sort of uh, disenfranchised 
key populations uh, within the United States. And I think what's important for us is to think about uh, what that means and, and how, that, uh, how that creates certain things. Like uh, one of the things, the other thing we try to argue along with this notion of race as a master category template is to really underscore, once again, the continuing instability about race right. and racial meanings. Uh, one could see this in a number of ways. Uh, uh, the discussion with Eduardo, for example, about uh, Latinos being an ethnicity or a race um, and the way the, the federal government, I mean, the Census Bureau has been entertaining a, a group of things which are called the alternative questionnaire experiments, which may result in the next census in 2020 having Latinos being seen as a racial category, not as an ethnic one like they are now. Mm. You know, you either Latino or non-Latino as an ethnicity. Um, this also pervades, we think, in the uh, genomic and biomedical research that increasingly we are witnessing a rebiologization of what race is uh, in the wake of the Human Genome Project. And that many of this takes the uh, form of of fields such as pharmacogenomics to create sort of tailor-made designer drugs, some of which are highly racially coded. Uh, it's about criminal forensics. I think last week in the New York Times was an article about how people are trying to use uh, DNA ba uh, databases to reconstruct what potential suspects may look like, including around race. So within criminal forensics, you have this kind of uh, issues around mm. trying to uh, discern people. And obviously, we have an explosion of people in, interested in sort of uh, finding their roots through genetic means. Uh, through Skip Gates and Oprah have certainly pushed a lot around the ethnic ancestry stuff right. to uh, find these things. What we're seeing, I think, in many respects, after thinking that the concept of race as a biological or genetic concept had been thrown into the dustbin of history, really a kind of re-emergence, a re-inscription of race mm -hmm. around these things. The point is, race continually morphs, it continually changes. There's a continuing instability to the very concept itself. Right. Let me, let me just learn anything about this. Of course. You know, um, I'm constantly telling my students, I think we're really getting this message a lot here in this conference too, to try to go deeper, try to go deeper into the concepts, the meaning of the concept, the historical situatedness of the concept, the political conflicts that have formed this conflict. Right, and this, I'm coming off this idea of race as a master category, but um, you know, just as an example, take social constructionism. The idea of the social constructedness of race is normally seen as a fairly recent idea, first argued probably by Du Bois and Kelly Miller and early black uh, activist intellectuals in the United States and then taken up because no one was reading, no white people were reading black intellectuals, taken up again in the Chicago school in the 1930s, 20s and 30s. But when you think about social construction, and you go back to the original encounters that created the Americas that we know, that named the Americas, that set up not only the US, but the rest of the hemisphere, those encounters between Europeans and Native people and between uh, Europeans and Africans enslaved, quickly enslaved Africans, enslaved by the Brazil, uh, by the Portuguese in Brazil uh, well before the English and the, uh, uh, the French and so on. Those encounters already had a kind of a peculiar racial dimension, not in the sense that they were theorized in a big way. I mean, there were religious dimensions to that, to the in, interpretations of the time, but because it was absolutely necessary in order to rule these new t territories that, that you know who is settler, who is conquistador, and who is native, who is indig indigenous. And in the same way, you need to know who is white, or European, let's say, white, and who is black. And that um, optical, phenotypic, corporeal dimension of race um, had very little content at first be beyond the body itself. And yet that was enough 
to generate whole systems of, of rule and also consciousness for resistance and very early slave revolts and uh, indigenous challenges to invaders. So it's only later that you start to get more uh, rational, uh, rational, rationalized, enlightenment-based, and so on, scientific or so-called so scientific mm -hmm. accounts about race that you know, that that explain that explain uh, uh, purport to explain these these dimensions of the of the concept in in, in mm -hmm. greater depth. So right from the beginning, there's something like social construction, or I guess you could call it political construction, that's involved with chattelizing people, and that's involved with uh, perpetrating wholesale violence against people. And that uh, chattelization then uh, also relates to the treatment of women. Obviously, women as chattel is not exactly a new notion in American you know, world history. So, uh, and it also relates to class in the sense of how uh, slavery works as a class system. So you can also say that from the very, very beginning, there's something like intersectionality. I'm not, I don't want to overstate that, but uh, it's that, it's that ne necessity of doing uh, what uh, the philosopher Ian Hacking has called making up people. It's a necessity of making up people in social, political, economic context that, that generates this sort of template notion of race. Yeah, yeah. It, wow. Um, you know, when you were talking about the racial body, I started thinking about the, the sort of hyper necessity of sort of making a racial body, distinguishing it from you know, the conquistador, as you put it. And I started wondering about how, how you might connect that to the triumph of a particular era of colorblindness. I mean, Crenshaw is making it clear that this isn't the first time around that we've done that kind of thing. But if we take the triumph of the last 30 years, right, how does the racial body connect to this notion of colorblindness? How are you going to start on that? Well, um, I think there's a lot of different things about that. I mean, first of all, the thing I already hinted at uh, about the need to be ocular, the need to be optical, is really central. And it's interesting, there's a, uh, a law professor and sociologist named Osagi Obasoji uh, out in California. He's at both UCSF and Hastings uh, Law School who's written a book called Blind, Blinded by Sight. I highly recommend this book. Uh, it's a, uh, an empirical study, an interview-based study um, of how people blind from birth see race. And obviously that's a, you know, a, a pretty interesting take on the whole colorblindness issue, isn't it? If you can't see at all, what, if you're already blind, I mean, how can you possibly see race and, or anything else? And uh, what Osagi finds is, uh, of course, that uh, blind people, people blind from birth, see race, maybe I should say, see race very, very well. Because, again, the social constructedness of race is much more than phenotypical, much more than uh, corporeal. Um, but I think it also is it's interesting to note what a neologism colorblindness is in, in, in uh, Justice Harlan's uh, dissent in Plessy. Um, for one thing, race, we, use, we definitely use, and it's always been used, this idea of color, the ocular, visible, et cetera. Uh, but on the other hand, race is about a lot of other things besides and um, may not even be about color in certain ways. A lot of times, or at least sometimes, you can't tell by looking at someone, even if you are sighted what their race is. So, I mean, it's a, ne it's a neologism, 
Buddhism in, in that way that it's about a sort of a biological, optical, ophthalmological metaphor being applied in this way. I mean, it's also um, uh, a, ne uh, a neologism in, in, in another sense, too, in that if you look at the descent, you look at Justice Harlan's uh, rap, I mean, Kim began to talk about this, but you can go uh, uh, quite a bit farther with, with what he had to say. I mean, for example, what he had to say about Asians. And Chinese, Chinese Asians in particular. In that descent, you know. So, uh, there's... What was that? It, it was that, and Kim knows this better than, than we you do. Should have which is that this there line. is a group they, that they say which uh, we need to exclude from our political social community. They can They're never so live among us. From us. They They're are so the different. racialized other in this instance becomes the Chinese. And yet not subject to segregation. And yet not subject to segregation. Um, it, uh, not to disturb this point, but it does really point to understanding this kind of relational dimension about race as a whole, is that we, uh, different groups, are sort of um, unequally positioned in respect to, to each other. And I think that's uh, something that um, was, was sort of very important mm -hmm. too, to take us off into another thing, which was to um, think about the foundational aspects of certainly the bi black white binary in the United States, but also to think about how other groups have been implicated in position with respect to each other. And oftentimes, um, that is not to just do a sort of comparative treatment of how one group was treated as opposed to another, but to understand the ways in which, um, I think Natalia Molina has a, a book out called uh, How Race is Made in America, which really is about um, Mexican immigration and community formation. But what's interesting about it, she says that it's really important to look at the uh, transferability of like racial scripts, that certain kinds of scripts, certain kinds of ways of understanding are often applied to one group and then are, are used to talk about another group and are modified or mutated in the process and other groups sort of draw upon those scripts as well. So um, this speaks again to Eduardo's notion about paying attention to what racial hierarchy is gonna look like in the United States in the coming years, you know? Um, and, and Eduardo offers this model of the Latin Americanization of race, this kind of um, tripartite model of it. It's gonna be really interesting, particularly as the demographic composition of the nation shifts dramatically, which is felt in different regions and locales more heavily than others, mm -hmm. is to see how people get racially positioned. And what are the ways? What is it? How are Latinos received in parts of the South, which have historically been uh, had black-white relations as they enter in large numbers? What does that mean? How, how are they kinds of, uh, what are the kinds of things? And oftentimes this, as I said, gets played out much more locally. But it sort of points us to looking at these kinds of phenomena in different cities and regions as an important barometer of how um, political positioning may be shifting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and that, you'll probably get to this as a question, but that's something I think we should really <laughs> spend some time talking about, given everything we've heard so far especially, which is just how are political developments in the United States, shaping and being shaped by race today. Uh, we're, I, I, I hesitate to say this, but I think it's true. I think we're way behind the curve. Mm -hmm. We're really, you know, we learn as, as social scientists, as philosophers, as, as Hegel said and so on, as, as, as thinkers, as students, we're always being taught by act, activism, by movements, by state activity, by the kinds of conflicts that are emerging in practice. And you know, we've got to try, keep trying to catch up, and keep trying to explain that. Yeah. So I think we'll get into that. Well, but, but I mean, now it's fine. I mean, there's no, there's no, no point in, you know, the iron's hot, I say, oh, you, you know. You have no, 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 I, my, my questions are just vehicles for conversation. So go ahead, go on for it right now. Well, I mean, are, are we further behind now? vis-a-vis -vis what's needed and, and the circumstance than we were, say, during the early stages of what you call the Great Transformation? Are we, you know, how far behind are we? Do we, are we have a, an inadequate kind of language and political set of structures to, to confront 
the sort of hegemonic ideology of colorblindness, or, or are we well, about the same? Well, I think that's part of it. I, I think, you know, we've been exploring throughout the course of those discussions about uh, what post-raciality is or is not. I, I, I love to think about comparing it to uh, uh, post-colonialism as a kind of analogy. Mm -hmm. To understand that post racial does not mean we've totally moved uh, into a colorblind society, but merely a kind of interesting variant of it, which doesn't have the same sort of formal notions of inequality maybe woven through the law. I think what's really interesting is the ways in which we, we have been behind the curve in terms of being able to have a kind of um, very succinct and very compelling kind of uh, alternative vision of what we think race should or shouldn't be in the United States. And I think this is apparent, I mean, I notice this in the classrooms too. Well, one thing is to get students to think beyond um, this notion that we are colorblind. Students often say, you know, uh, they, they, they don't treat people by color. They look, you know, and, and yet when you go into it and ask them to interrogate how they move through everyday life and the kinds of ways they respond to a, 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 a fellow student, to a faculty member, to someone at the local um, uh, convenience store, all these things, they, they start come pouring out with these kinds of racial kinds of perceptions they have of people. So it's kind of, uh, it's kind of disingenuous yeah. to think we can do that. On the other hand, what's interesting too is the ways in which um, uh, I think one important gesture we try to make in the book too is try to uh, link up neoliberalism with color blindness mm -hmm. and to say that the, the whole neoliberal project uh, dependence on the market, the collapse of the safety net, uh, the shrinking down of, uh, of what is considered to be the public sector mm -hmm. in favor of privatization, at its core um, has an explicit racial dimension. And that much of the gains of that kind of neoliberal project may be because people um, uh, I realize, I mean, or it appeals, maybe on either a conscious or unconscious level around this. And, um, this gets to something which, you know, we could debate here. I, I'd love to talk to Eduardo about this more, uh, particularly about what the possibilities for sort of interracial coalitions are around this. Because it seems in some aspects that the whole um, post-racial period is, is, there's a tremendous amount, it seems, of anxiety among parts of the white population. Mm -hmm. uh, and that anxiety is often translated into um, these kinds of neoliberal projects, if because um, they believe the expansion of the public, the social sector, is not something that benefits them, it benefits that racial other. Mm. And, in, and, and so in so doing, it kind of shifts blame, it kind of talks about, yeah, we need to sort of privatize solutions. At least I'm working, we'll have our own sort of neighborhood security force or something. There's ways in which those two things are more, in, intensely interconnected and intertwined yeah. than in our general discussion we think about. And I think that's something we need to um, really focus on, to look at in certain ways, to uh, re refute in many ways mm -hmm. the kind of ideology of colorblindness. Let me do a quick, yeah. uh, another variation, on, uh, another riff on that thing. You know, um, we, we tend to believe that our situation is more permanent, our racial situation is more, in the present, is more fixed than it normally is, than it really is. I mean, uh, it's hard to remember that we live in history. It's hard to remember when racial injury is being done and when racial movements are trying to combat it and when there's a sort of a perpetual um, atmosphere of crisis that we, we anti-racist people um, are living in and, 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 and uh, you know, deeply connected to. But the fact that we live in history is something to, to really consider, even if you want to think about the recent trajectory of uh, racial politics. I mean, the, uh, first of all, neoliberalism is a global phenomenon are the our anti-racist movements, our identity politics movements, which were basically sparked by the civil rights movement, um, 
In other words, you know, the long relationship between uh, feminism and, and anti-racism and so on is something that you know we could talk about at another point. But apart from the reiterations, there was a major uh, interaction in the 1960s, generating the second, what we call second wave feminism. Um, other identity politics movements too arose in the 60s because of the upsurge of the black movement. And the, black, the upsurge of the black movement was a case of a worldwide phenomenon. It was not just in the United States, although we are very provincial people, even <laughs> we, you know, big time intellectuals and so on in the United States, we tend to think the world ends at the oceans and all that. But in fact, the U.S. civil rights movement, the black movement in the United States, was deeply intertwined with anti-colonial, anti-imperial movements worldwide. And um, the racial dimensions of those movements shaped our movement in the United States, and vice versa, the anti-racist dimensions of our movement also interacted with anti-imperialism. So think about a worldwide crisis of race. Start on that. Something that also, after World War II, something that also is generating all kinds of simultaneous interacting identity politics movements. A feminist movement, not just a U.S. movement. The gay issues, what we now call LGBT, what used to be called gay liberation, then being generated as well. A whole range of other movements focused on identity, a deepening of politics beyond the classic Harold Lasky type of definition, who gets what, when, and where, uh, to um, as a notion of who are we? What is my social existence? What is my identity about? What access do I have to power, to freedom, to democracy? So that's a worldwide thing. Now that's what freaks out the, po the power structures. That's what threatens um, people in power in the United States too. We had Lewis Powell up there uh, from the Bakke decision, which was, by the way, I, I think it was 78, they're not 70. Wasn't it 78? Yeah, 78. Yeah, okay. Um, the, uh, so Lewis Powell was a, uh, a Nixon appointee who had been the head of the school board in Richmond, Virginia. And he had been a, a sort of a moderate, respectable segregationist. You know. <laughs> but, you know, not a... Not a, a, not a, a rabid segregationist. Not a, not a kind a, segregationist. Not a K, K, K guy. Kind of he had been a, uh, he had been a, uh, a ruling class, uh, uh, you know, white supremacist, if you can think of such a thing. Okay. So, uh, in 1971, just before he gets appointed to the Supreme Court, he writes a, a very famous memo urging businesses in the United States to organize politically, to form think tanks and political action committees to challenge the uh, upsurge of popular movements and to defend un inequality. He quite explicitly says this. And this memo um, is absolutely, becomes absolutely hege hegemonic in the American ruling class. It gets him appointed as the Supreme Court uh, by Nixon. And it also generates, the Amer well, it doesn't quite generate it, but it, it, it hugely augments the American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, these kinds of groups. It, and it, it creates uh, the, what we now know as the modern right, as a pro-business, neoliberal, ideologically neoliberal uh, 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 alliance. Not just a class alliance, though. It is a class alliance, but what they're really freaked out about is not particularly trade unions or explicit working class movements, although they don't like those either. What they really don't like is identity politics because they're, they're afraid that the great society will be consolidated as true social democracy. Remember that the New Deal was a social democratic initiative that could come into being because of its racism, because it, in order to organize this support uh, for the New Deal, 
Roosevelt had to make a whole series of concessions to the, to the uh, Dixiecrat South, and by the way, also to the Republican Southwest, which excluded farm workers, which excluded domestic workers um, from Social Security and uh, uh, labor law protection and so on. So uh, the New Deal was okay as long as it was a white social democracy. But when it threatened in the 1960s, in the later 1960s, under LBJ, uh, I won't get into LBJ and Selma or any of that, uh, uh, to become a more comprehensive social democratic state policy, that's when the Powell memo really resonated. And it's not just his, his memo, obviously, that was just a clear articulation of a, a major political shift to the right that happened in the United States. That's where neoliberalism really took yeah. off. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting also to think, I'll, I'll stop in a second, it's interesting also to think about how neoliberalism could never have worked as explicit white supremacy. Right. Because there just had been too many re-articulations, that's the word we should talk about, um, in, in the political process, too many transformations in the political process as a result of not only the black movement, but also its allied movements, the anti-war movement too, and, and femi second wave feminism. So it had to so slowly craft a, uh, call it reactionary, a racial reactionary okay. framework, but it wasn't only racial reactionary, it was a re-articulated framework that could incorporate and hegemonize the demands of black folk, of brown folk, of women, and so on. Um, you know, and use that, and kind of use that identity politics to generate an, identi an identity politics of the right. Mm -hmm. And that's what colorblindness is. That's what the right to life is. Excuse me, the right to life? <laughs> I mean, Let's, let's, let's just think about the meaning of that, of, of some of these terms, you know. I'm colorblind, I believe in the right to life. I don't want special rights for gay people, you know. They're just the same as everything. That whole logic is deeply, deeply linked to neoliberalism, to marketization, as Michael said, and to the, de the defeat of social democracy, at least temporary, hopefully temporary defeat of social democracy in the United States. So. So let's go to the word you to rearticulation here because in in the book it seems to me you you guys ultimately suggest that it's sort of you know it's it's a kind of word that could be used the way Stuart Hall uses hegemony you know it's sort of it's hard work it's a struggle it's back and forth it's not a complete process and that in fact identity politics isn't just the domain of the marginal the outside various constituencies in yeah. fact it's a project of the state and but we only talk about identity politics when it's coming from people on the outside but and that there's this challenge not you uh, others you mm -hmm. know think about identity mm -hmm. politics as the problem so can you talk about this re-articulation? I think if you could back the audience up for a minute into your conversation about the constitution of new racial subjects with black subject, collective subjectivity throughout the Great Transformation, and then the struggle itself. Well, the struggle itself. That, I mean, that's a real, I mean, it's kind of a sweeping kind of political trajectory of where that stuff ends up. Um, I want to say this about the concept of identity politics too, is that mm -hmm. one could imagine the Tea Party as a kind of version of identity mm -hmm. politics as well. So it's not only that it sort of surfaces on the left end of the political spectrum that is uh, challenging um, notions of state power. It could be those mm -hmm. that are sort of, well, think about this. There was a moment where the Tea Party was extremely critical of the government's uh, um, bankrolling of uh, big financial institutions in uh, and the big banks, right? There could have been a moment uh, where Occupy and, uh, and the Tea Party kind of converged, but uh, that didn't happen. Um, and things spun off into social issues. I think the interesting uh, thing about the concept of, of, of racial rearticulation that, that we were thinking of is that how uh, certain kinds of themes, ideas, at one moment can be um, reshaped by a different political force towards different ends. Uh, the clearest example of this is, uh, I remember Michael Eric Dyson suggesting that we should have a moratorium on King's I Have a Dream speech, because the notion, that line about 
be having their children judged by the content of the character and not by the color of the skin. He says it's been used by every conservative to, uh, to justify why we needed to shut down a lot of more uh, progressive race-based demands. And uh, it's true. So in, in, in a sense, what we're continually grappling with in the political realm is how major themes um, come to capture the kind of larger political imagination and the kinds of uses they are being put to right. in some ways. Mm -hmm. so, um, in the, so what I was trying to suggest about this, uh, what Howie and I are trying to suggest about this links between neoliberalism and race, um, too, is really the kind of process of, of rearticulation. If, in fact, you can't sort of make explicit kinds of political demands to like uh, deny um, outright, you know, enforce uh, racial segregation in schools or, or uh, race wage, wage gaps, as, as Tom Shapiro sort of uh, levied out. How do, you, how do you sort of rationalize those kinds of, of glaring inequalities? Mm -hmm. Inequalities with respect to um, wealth, wealth accumulation and wealth transfers in the United States. It seems to me that um, what, what's underlying here, uh, and I want to get back on this other thing, is that there's been ways in which, and I want to come back to this kind of, not, not to stress it out too much, but this kind of notion about uh, white racial anxiety mm -hmm. in different sectors. And in the fact that what we're having, what we're confronting in many ways is a kind of multiple otherings that are going on in our society, of which people are considered to be marginal, a drain on the economy. People are seen as sort of outside the orbit of who we should be concerned about in terms of public and uh, social welfare. And that, that, that kind of thing has allowed uh, what presumably are economic policies to be, to be sort of foisted upon us without understanding their kind of uh, racialized dimension. So the point is, in re-articulating these things, is to figure out how to talk about these processes right. as being explicitly racial ones and up against the sort of kind of hegemonic kinds of concepts we may be left with here around color blindness. Um, I, I'm not sure that that goes into this political historical trajectory of, of, okay. of, uh, of uh, rearticulation. But I also wanted to mention something else that I think is very important for us to uh, think about, particularly um, that increasingly it's been very interesting to me how much of the kind of uh, work around race, uh, particularly in the academy, is, is very much siloed, to use an agricultural metaphor here, um, into not in particular disciplines, but particular kinds of broad areas of inquiry. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. Um, that and this is, I, I think, Tom Shapiro's work is, is terrific on looking at uh, the kind of structural disparities that, that happen. But you know, there's a lot of other folks, like social psychologists and mind scientists, who are working on issues around implicit bias whose claims are that even beyond our conscious attempts or, or thinking about it, that we make these kinds of, of, of assumptions that operate below the radar, if you will, and that we all harbor these kinds of implicit kinds of racial, gender, uh, excuse me, sexual uh, um, uh, kinds of biases towards different groups. And yet, there doesn't seem to be a kind of way in which there's been a very vibrant kind of conversation exchange mm -hmm. between linking some of the things that are going on in the social sciences and the mind sciences with the more kinds of structural institutional accounts around racial disparities. And we might bring in, too, people are doing absolutely fantastic work on cultural representations and cultural practices. Mm -hmm. And so how do uh, all these things sort of come together to, um, to really create a much more um, vibrant kind of social theory about how we understand not only race and racism, but how we understand uh, the kinds of ways in which other, yeah, yeah. Uh, other groups have been uh, stratified I mean, in different ways. Yeah. I, I want you to talk, but let me just comment on this very quickly, which is to say, I mean, part of what Eduardo was getting at, right, was that the disciplines themselves are not designed to examine yes. these systematic That's questions correct. about race across the board. <laughs> They, they're siloed not by accident because it, the whole conversation would change the entire, it seems to me. So is, that, is this part of the neoliberal project? I mean, where do you put the body of ideas that we're oh, generating in the question. context? I don't know. You know, it's part of, I mean, I think in many respects, it's just reflective of academic culture as a whole. 
that people are sort of rewarded for their performance within a particular kind of disciplinary uh, home, right? You're sort of, uh, what are the kinds of ways you publish in the, uh, uh, the mainstream journals that reflect the discipline or something where, where, in fact, if you go outside the boundaries of that, if you engage in kinds of ways of, of, of crossing boundaries and trying to engage things across different, um, not only dis I mean disciplines, but also whole areas of human inquiry, I mean, much of that is sort of not rewarded in, in a certain sense, you know? Yeah. You've got to make a real overture to say, I'm going to talk to these folks because some of the stuff mm -hmm. I can't understand right. in mind sciences, you know? Okay, well, there's that. Right. <laughs> I know. Trust me. But I mean, I, I, just, I guess what I'm a little bit, what I want to push on here that I'm hearing here and I heard other parts of today is, you know, a sense that if you think of colorblindness as an ideology in which, you know, that is gripping us, right, and we look at that in terms of the disciplinary consequences of that blindness. Everyone's mm -hmm. talked about students and all of us and the anxieties that you're referring to here, which stem from being trapped between it or sort of in some never, never land, right, where you know it's not really colorblind, but you don't want to be a past version of a prejudiced racial person. So where do we go? And where's the rhetorical, where's the intellectual sort of framework that we can develop to sort of free us from that? Um, and, 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 and how academic categories make that difficult. I mean, not that you have to, but how. I'll let Howie answer that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, we need a he looks ready. Much bigger, <laughs> we need a much bigger critique of our disciplines than we have now. We really have to get a lot more radical than we are. Now, uh, Tim has been involved. Uh, George Lipsitz has been involved in a large project, a national project. Michael was also somewhat involved with it. Uh, called Colorblindness Across the Disciplines. I don't want to speak for you on that. You can definitely talk about it better than I. But the basic idea, just really briefly, is that all of our disciplines are structured by race very fundamentally. If you think about who is the subject of economics, the individual ma uh, interest maximizer, that, is, that has a deep, that subject, that orientation has a deep, obviously, commitment to capitalism, but beyond that commitment to capitalism, it also has a commitment to whiteness, white, white men, and, and maleness. White men were the only ones who could own property. White men were the only ones who it really were supposed to be in the marketplace at all. If you think about who is the subject of anthropology, there's been a lot of work now, Montia, Diawara, and other people have tried to turn anthropology around so that people in Africa are doing field work in Manhattan. You know, we've got a long way to go before that gets to where it needs to be, right? I mean, that, that other, that exoticized other in, ethno in, in ethnology, in ethnography, is a central thing. If you think about history, the discipline of history, David could talk much more about this than, than I, but you know, the, it, one of the many, many in, innovations of Du Bois's Black Reconstruction was to undo the standard account of slavery and its, its uh, an, an abolition that happened and emancipation, that, that, that happened to rule the entire field of history under the hegemony of uh, Ulrich Phillips and people like that. Um, and you know, what an amazing, heroic work of historic, of not only his, his, historianism, <laughs> historiography that book was, because it's completely turned around the, the subject positions that existed in that historical account, you know, with the character baggers coming from the north and, you know, usurping the. The, the, the romantic uh, traditional values of the South, the gone with the wind view of history. And, okay, you can go like, you can go discipline by discipline in the humanities and the social sciences, even to some extent in the natural sciences, and, and reclaim or undo and reclaim our disciplines. Now, this is not my insight. This is Kim's insight and, and George's insight and other people's insight. So, I mean, in terms of thinking about our disciplines and how we deal with colorblindness. We have to you know, really interrogate their intellectual premises. And this is going to get you in trouble, students. This is going to get you in trouble. You know, junior people, as you try to get tenure. I mean, I, you know, that you'll have support too. You shouldn't do it, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't 
fail to do it, but, but it's tough. It's really tough. We ourselves are captured by this thing that we want to critique. Uh, can I say one other quick thing about color blindness? I know. Sure, 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 sure. You know, if we, if we do live in history, what is the state of the colorblind, of colorblind ideologies hegemony in America and the United States today? Is it, how consolidated is it? How, in, how endangered is it? How contradictory is it? I mean, here is this state that Kim has talked about so eloquently, this Supreme Court which seems to think that racism is a problem mainly faced by white people. Um, here is a state claiming on the broadest possible terms that colorblindness is the law of the land. It's embedded in the Constitution itself. It's nothing in question. And yet, you cannot rule this country. You cannot rule this country on that basis. You cannot ignore race in any, in any uh, agency, in any branch of government, in any policy. Mm -hmm. I mean, tax policy. Uh, shall we, I mean, shall we talk about those foreclosures that Tom was involved in, in discussing? Uh, uh, foreign policy, Islamophobia, uh, policing, racial profiling. I mean, you know, it's not like the state is actually practicing colorblindness. Quite the contrary. And so isn't that contradiction actually surging in some ways? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to be easy to overdo, uh, overturn Colbyn. It's far from it. Uh, it's got a huge political base. Um, but at the same time, it's clear that this set of contradictions is not, uh, yeah, this mm -hmm. set of problems, you know, mm -hmm. is not the last set we're going to face. We're going to face. Right. But so I'm hearing you say there's some opportunity there. And so uh, as we move to the section where I want to bring other people's questions mm -hmm. in, do you think that Obama uh, in his... In, in what he ultimately stood for and how little he was able to do, as many people pointed out, did he sort of create this possibility? In other words, did his failure, it, could it be a gateway to a certain kind of second great transformation? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not a gateway. How about just a little uh, tiny like, pathway? Did it, did, it, did it create a, a crack in the door or anything like that? Yeah, yeah I'll, no, I'll go I, down to a crack yeah. in the door. Yeah, I'll go. I got to say, in, in, in uh, taken in total, probably not, you know, mm. that in fact, um, in many ways, he's always been sort of uh, uh, constrained by what he could what he Right, could right. No, we're in agreement, agreement on that. Yeah. Let me rephrase it. I'm saying, is it possible that the way he failed has made people realize the impossibility? In other words, I mean, there was a sense in which there was a tremendous amount of support for what Obama was going to do. And in particular for what he was going to do both symbolically and politically for African Americans and people of African descent in general. That has not happened, in fact, as the wealth gap and, you know, et cetera. Everyone's talk hinted in some way about what this Obama era has meant. So I'm, I guess what I'm, you sounded optimistic and I'm wondering <laughs> what creates that yeah. optimism? Is it, is it the evolution of colorblindness in terms of people's, the gaps people are seeing? Or is it that, that to have a black man rule the state and produce the same or worse results finally makes people go, okay, this is about something else? I mean, is it possible? You know, I'm known for my uh, inveterate <laughs> optimism. I'm also known for always being disappointed when it doesn't come true. But, um, it, yeah, I mean, you said Obama symbolically, Obama politically. Those are two very, very different things, obviously. Um, I think symbolically, Ob Obama... Uh, was important, is important, but I don't think he's particularly different from the uh, sort of left-wing neoliberal, center-left neoliberalism mm -hmm. that we saw embodied before him in Clinton, say. Um, the, uh, you know, the, um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I think probably all of us in this room are struggling with, with what we think about Obama. There, was, there were some people for whom Obama was like Neo, you know. The one. The one. <laughs> <laughs> and there were other people who right from the beginning uh, proper, properly uh, critiqued him, and that's also happened here. I've 
special uh, 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 Eduardo mentioned, made this point. It's like a shill for Wall Street, you know, having made the kinds of concessions to Pritzkers and so on and so forth. He really has not uh, ever, it had never had any intention. He was actually, we, we were duped by Obama. I, you know, I, I, I would like to reject both of those ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would really uh, rather say that I mean, if, if, if we actually, I think we use some of this language in the book. And most of the stuff we're talking about people, we try to defend in this book. Uh, uh, if he wasn't Neo and if he wasn't a show for, the Wall Street, for Wall Street, so if you can rule out those two, then we're in the realm of normal politics. Mm. And in, in terms of normal politics, there has been um, clearly a major set of mistakes that Obama made or decisions that he was perhaps forced to make. I'm not sure. It doesn't really matter because it's what happened that matters, what you do, not what you would like to do. Uh, a major set of mi mistakes that he made and not and trying so hard to be, quote unquote, not the black president, but everybody's president, and not seeing uh, red states and blue states, but only the United States and all that other kind of rhetoric. Um, that, that did, in many, many ways, um, uh, disempower him and cast him in a much more um, um, sort of mediocre and second-rate leadership position that he perhaps that he perhaps could have held. But again, think about being in history. I mean, a good transition. Do people know Chukufu Zuberi? Mm -hmm. uh, leading, yes. Leading, <laughs> yeah. leading black demographer, uh, sociologist at Penn, who uh, documented the transition to power in South Africa in 1994. And, you know, think about the what the ANC was confronted with. I'm not saying that Obama was facing that momentous a transition as Mandela was facing, but there was some resemblance. I mean, you know, they, they, it's clear that worldwide economic and political forces ganged up on the ANC to say, you can make a certain small set of concessions and that's it, baby. Do anything more, you'll face capital strikes, you'll face internal warfare, possible invasion, uh, isolation from world markets, deep impo impoverishment, and there will be a bloodbath in South Africa. And Mandela, also led by uh, Joe Slovo, the head of the, the, uh, that, the, at time, that time the head of the South African Communist Party, made concessions. He said, okay, we'll do something, we'll go for something gradual, we'll, we'll take a little bit because we can't fulfill our own demands and our own freedom charter of a socialist South Africa. Um, I think some version of that confronted Obama. Not, um, not as apocalyptic a version. I think he had a lot more room, theoretically had a lot more room than, that, than, than uh, Mandela had. But in, in actual practice, I think he did, he, he did cave. And, you know, it, just small, I mean, not small, but just single policies that he could have adopted. Mm -hmm. For example, subsidizing mortgages in foreclosure and underwater in the same way that they subsidized, you know, AIG and, and uh, City, Citibank and so on and J.P. Morgan Chase. That kind of, those kinds of, uh, activities would have deeply changed the, the structure of American politics and could have built a much bigger base on the left and, and obviously would have been opposed tremendously. But, you know, they also, by the way, would have been strong anti-racist policy because black people and brown people were unduly, as Tom can tell you, I don't know if Tom is still here, uh, were unduly victimized, you know, disproportionately victimized by the foreclosure crisis yeah. of 2008. So, you know, there were serious mistakes, too. Mm -hmm. Where we're at now, you know, I don't think we're in much of a different place having had Obama as president than we would have been in if we had had Hillary Clinton.
Well, on the, on the question, well, that's, that's a whole other afternoon talk. But, um, but I mean, on the question of racial subjectivity, right, of the construction of a new racial subjectivity that challenges historical powers, I think, I'm never the optimistic one, but I'm going to take over the mantle here for a brief moment and say that, you know, the kinds of social movements that are gathering now have a kind of steam that I think are not only connected to previous legacies, but connected to a sense of realizing that certain structural symbol figures, symbolic figures, are not going to make this happen. And I think you could have said this eight years ago, and people would have understood it conceptually, but I think there's a gut knowing now mm -hmm. that it's on us, and that mm -hmm. us meaning young people that, right. recognize that. Maybe this is my great hope, right? But I do think that if, if Obama did anything that Hillary couldn't have done, maybe it was that, you know, in terms of the... So, but go ahead, Michael, why don't no, you I respond just, to that, and no, then we're going to open it up for questions. That sounds good. Um, let me say this, too, just as a preface to this, that uh, Howie and I have a favorite Clinton, and that's uh, funk master George Clinton. Remember yes. in the 80s said, uh, we need to paint the White House black. Right. <laughs> and so that then came and sort of went in interesting ways for its own cultural reverberations. I think that's quite right. Um, it's interesting how the whole um, notion about Black Lives Matter have brought in um, different uh, accomplices, to use uh, Dave's word, about, uh, you know, and to think about other forms of stratification and difference as being impacted by uh, the violence of the state. This includes transgendered people, there's a big uh, demonstration actually in Oakland City Hall, um, which was orchestrated by um, groups of Filipinos who uh, operate on this ba banner, Pinoy's for, uh, uh, for, you know, for uh, Black Lives Matter. So it was just amazing the kind of groundswell. And here again, the template idea of not only a kind of category around oppression, but also a way of thinking about strategic mobilization too, mm -hmm. was really operative and sort of... Um, uh, sort of organizing these things. These things are uh, incredibly exciting events. There is issues, though. I, I mean, I hear maybe I'm being a little pessimistic, but and this speaks directly to some of the things Eduardo mentioned earlier. There's ways in which we think of racism in the popular imagination as um, notorious acts that are, are are scandalous, that offend our sensibilities. Exceptional. It, it, they're exceptional. It's, uh, it's Sterling's uh, former clipper owner's comments, or it's violence. You know, someone gets killed. That's that's the, or or hate violence is seen, and what gets buried is the kind of normalized ways right. in in which uh, race and racism operates, which people today have talked about. And so, what worries me is that we have these kinds of flashpoints where all of a sudden there's a whole lot of social movement and galvanization around the issue, and then it fades. And, and, and in other words, it, 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 what's necessary is to take an opportunity, something that's very dramatic uh, in, in people's minds, in the, in, in, the, in the media, and be able to spin different important narratives outside that immediate sphere. Like how do we, would we understand uh, police violence, how would we connect that up with other forms of state policies, perhaps? What is being contested in other sort of uh, policy arenas around issues? And how are these things connected in some ways? I think that's important. Like yeah. how to, you yeah, know, break it open. how to break it open as, as a thing and not sort of so much focus on the incident. It, well, not to say we can right. detract from the incident, but in fact, there's a limited shelf life political shelf life around sort of focusing on sort of dramatic acts of, of racial violence that you need to extend out.